Welcome to Vintage Fishing Radio, where we discuss the hot bite and all things fishing. With your hosts, Dustin Clark and Lewis Chapman. Fish on! Welcome back to Vantage Fishing Radio. This is Lewis Chapman, and my normal partner in crime, Dustin Clark, is uh, burning the midnight oil tonight. He's he's on call and, and working. So, uh, Jason Reed, friend of the show, is filling in for him today. How are you doing, Jason? I'm doing pretty good, pretty good. Uh, Kyle Flavor and Alter is uh, catching fish over this last weekend, or has plans to get out this uh, next weekend to, to get on the hot bite. For sure. Um, so, uh, you know, this is episode 16, so things are kind of moving along pretty well. If you miss 15, it's a, it's a must listen. It's all about walleye, the ice off bite and everything like that. It's more walleye content than your mind can handle, um, with Ron Lowry. So definitely check that one out. But as far as this episode, we're going to, uh, just have a little bit open forum. Uh, Jason, I think has been up on some Wyoming, uh, ice fishing and, I had some plans to get out on an open water bite and, and uh, the storm kind of crushed that, but I'd still like to talk about what the plans were. Uh, and then finally, I did go to the big Rip Your Water uh, event with the Crosswaters, which is uh, a film by Riversmith. And it was actually a fundraiser, which I didn't realize that I was going to that. And it turned out to be fairly interesting. So we'll, we'll jump in and talk about that a little bit. And then, uh, We'll actually spend a whole segment uh, going over uh, the St. Brain fishing experience, which is coming up in about two weeks. So I sat down and had a great interview with uh, Sean Dunlevy, and and we could talk about the park a little bit. And so, yeah, there's definitely a lot of fishing we can get to. Um, how about it, Jason? Do you want to just jump in, and we'll uh, we'll go right to Wyoming? Absolutely. You know, I've um, been fishing uh, ice fishing pretty much every weekend since. Uh, a uh, mid-November with some alpine lakes and started getting burned out on the I-70 drive with a lot of the ski traffic and you know nothing wrong with fishing 11 mile in Intero but uh, always looking for that new challenge so um, had a friend of a friend uh, invite me up to fish Wyoming and had a pretty uh, couple of epic go arounds with some you know splake, big brookies, grayling, even some tiger muskie thrown in there so you know kind of uh Kind of focusing that way now. Um, I'm kind of finishing off the ice fishing and setting up some goals to fish Wyoming a little bit more. And for a lot of listeners out there, if you're in the Metro Denver area, you know I challenge you to, to go up to Wyoming. Um, the drive time is right at, or maybe even a little faster than going down to South Park. And if you're in the, the northern area of Colorado, definitely faster to go up to Wyoming than head to Denver down the South Park. So a lot of good fishing through there. I want to explore uh, Kirk Gowdy State Park had some big, big uh, rainbows that were uh, big type jaws and uh, got a little intel that the crystal lakes hold golden. So one of those tough fish to catch in Colorado. Looks like that might just be uh, north of the border. So definitely my hot bite has been uh, that area between um, Cheyenne and Laramie. We're fishing out right off of like uh, the major highways right through there just kind of almost blindly going out of some of those lakes with a buddy or two of them and you know a lot of success up that, that way so much that I actually bought a, a, a seasoned uh, the, the Wyoming seasoned uh, license so that's where my hot bite's been lately and uh, if I need that short little bite I've been I have been going up to a world as a road bite's been pretty steady I just do caution you if it's a warm spell like just make sure you're out there with a buddy and uh, you know have a spud bar out there and uh, a means to uh, break the ice. Yeah, you know, Ron last episode covered a lot about Aurora too, so it sounds like it's a great place to fish. And after this cold spell, I think the ice is thickening it up a bunch. But uh, you're right; who knows where it really is after all the th- the the unthawing and then freezing and then unthawing. Its conditions can be pretty suspect. But um, you were talking about the season pass and or fishing license for Wyoming. So what's that entail? Did you get the one day before that, or I mean, how much is it so to uh, fish Wyoming? Right. So at out of state, you can get a one day, which is great. I think it's, uh, I mean, I want to say it's like 1225, maybe 1425 for a one day. And they've got a piece on there. It's all through the internet where you could just basically do it on your phone and take a screenshot and you're okay with that. And then I just did the same thing. I've gone back and like I kind of did some math to it and 
really excited to get up there in the float tube and fly fish some of these lakes. Uh, just kind of invested into the uh, out of state uh, license, which I think ended up being maybe 112 bucks or so. So not a bad one when I'm always looking for those new waters and, you know, just based on, you know, catching some big squid, big brookies, uh, the potential for some big green, tiger muskie, and goldens, you know, all kind of uh, key fish that we all like to catch that are harder to find. And I'll invest a couple of dollars to push up to Wyoming this uh, spring and summer. And you're talking California golden trout? Absolutely. Yeah, that's a pretty hard fish to track down in Colorado. There is a few public waters you can fish them. Um, we won't hotspot those, but if you do your research, you can definitely find them. Um, so a little bit more prolific in Wyoming then when it comes to, to that fish? Absolutely. Um, I know the Wind River uh, range has uh, a lot of them up through there. But that's, you're looking at about a seven-hour drive from Denver up to there, and then you're hiking about anywhere from 10 to 20 miles in. Just like you were if you were in California, then this is not off the highway to find them. But I've uh, got a couple leads, uh, you know, doing a lot of that uh, research and web work, um, whether it's getting on the, the Internet and kind of really like, sifting through a lot of different forums and so forth or just pulling out the, the go-to uh you know books that i bought on amazon or you know just checked out at the library just doing some uh, old school yeah. research and uh you know plugging a couple lakes and you know i you never know especially going from you know the winter into the spring you know did the uh did the lake die off or what have you or you know if that intel is 10 years old what's it going to look like and i always hope that that 10 year uh data turns into, you know, monster fish. And, you know, fortunately, some of those lakes I was in Wyoming were, you know, fish in the high teens, low 20 on the inch mark. And we had a, you know, personal best uh, 17 and a half inch foot trout. So that'll get me back. Uh, the buddy catches 16 inch grayling. And I spoke with a, a Wyoming resident that pulled a 24 inch uh, tiger muskie out of one of the lakes. So uh, that right there, uh, you know, again, is going to keep pushing me back up to Wyoming until, uh, until I catch all those big fish up there. Yeah. So a couple of episodes ago, uh, John Schneider and I, we, we did a little segment on Splake and the, what kind of triggered me to, to talk about the fish on, on the show was a photo that I seen with Mike Gulley and that giant Splake. Was that with you up in Wyoming? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I caught a big one up there that was right around 18 and then, uh, Mike ended up with that 19 inch. And, uh, again, his first time on the water or actually on the ice and, uh, you know, it was a great experience because we got up there and uh, my blades and my auto were just dull. And we'd already just punched the first hole and we were at 18 inches of ice. And, you know, luckily our uh, ice fishing community is always pretty tight. And uh, asked another uh, group that was out there if we could borrow their uh, auger. And they punched us a couple of holes. And, you know, sure enough, Mike pulls in uh, just a monster spray. One of the tougher fish, I think, to catch in Colorado. They're out there. And I, I may or may not have caught one with you maybe six, seven years ago. About oh, we three did. in the morning on Ontario. We did. But, uh, Multiple. We did. We did. <laughs> but that's a t- it's a tough fish right now to catch in Colorado. Uh, not a lot of them out there. And uh, those people that know where they're at are uh, pretty tight lipped about it. But uh, again, yeah. you know, if you pull a 19 inch out your first time on the ice, uh, you've done some things right. Yeah, so for anybody that wants to to learn a little bit more about Splake, John and I went in pretty good depth on them, and uh, so head back to episode 14, and it's in one of the segments there, and you can learn everything that uh, we knew about Splake, which um, we hope to find out more, but it's quite a bit. But um, So what else kind of surprised you about Wyoming? It sounds like you're pretty stoked and pumped about it. It just obviously not heavily pressured like a lot of our uh, larger fisheries. In, uh, in Colorado, and I like that drive, you know, I-25 to, I believe it's uh, Highway 80 or 88, so it's a pretty uh, pretty good drive, especially here in the wintertime where I'm not going over passes, and, you know, just on ice a little bit faster than if I was going down to South, South Park, plus it's a new challenge, you know, I want to learn these new, uh, new fisheries, obviously icing them, and then I'm really excited for ice off, getting the float tube and pulling out the five weight and own big streamers at some of these big fish so i like that opportunity for some newer species and i kind of dedicated my 2019 to exploring that southern uh corridor of wyoming yeah for sure so i guess my last little question when it comes to wyoming fishing and i have not fished wyoming so this spring going up there with you uh, i'll really look forward to that on the float tube and 
and whatnot, maybe even some high alpine lakes up there. But um, so what's the deal? Like here in Colorado, you got the second rod stamp. You can have what, four or five or something like that up there? Do you know? So again, look at the uh, the regulations for wound, but you can have on specific lakes uh, up to six rods. Everywhere else it is two or uh, it's annotated by, uh, by lake, but uh, you don't have to buy a second rod stamp. It's kind of included as part of your license. So that's kind of a nice thing, especially if you're going up and uh, just going to one day pass, kind of thinking, you know, you got that second, uh, you're not paying another $5. It's, it's built into that that uh, a single uh, license. So it's not a bad little deal. And then you can manage six rods. Um, there's a couple of <laughs> lakes up there that you could do that. I think that would be a, kind of a, a different uh, type of experience that to throw, you know, whether it's six ice rods or uh, six open rods. but uh, there's yeah. lakes up there that they allow that. Yeah. Can you imagine trying to maintain six jaw jackers? It, it sounds like a full-time job in itself. You'd need to, to go back to work to, to rest up for the next day of ice fishing and managing six rods. Holy cow. That's right. You're going to be running from uh, jaw jacker to jaw jacker uh, all day long. Yeah. I better have a bulk order of uh, wax worms. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, well, you know, and you, we t- you talked a little bit about the, um, California gold, golden trout and, and a little bit of uh, the high Alpine there and some float tubing and kind of making me think a little bit of fly fishing. And that was kind of on my mind for this past weekend. Um, Jason, I, I wanted to get out and uh, fish the St. Vrain um, in Lyons and as well as Longmont for, you know, a good morning or whatnot Saturday. And I was checking weather reports and it looked like I was going to have an open window and the snow wasn't supposed to start till Saturday afternoon earlier in the week. So um, I was prepping, um, got the old five weight out, made sure that the line was good on it, put a new five uh, X leader, and I was getting excited to do some of the first fishing I've done since uh, the beginning of ice fishing season. And uh, the weather closed that down on me, but I'd still like to talk about it a little bit if uh, if your game to talk some fly fishing. Yeah, I always, um, you know, I've uh, took that on as a challenge a few years ago and invested uh, a lot of time into improving my uh, fly fishing game. Yeah, for sure. And so um, up here in Lyons, um, there's a lot of fly shops in Boulder, and there's some really good ones. But um, I always go to Laughing Grizzly in Longmont off of Highway 66 and 287. That's my favorite fly shop. And um, Dave and and Dick in there, that they, they know their stuff, and that they've always pointed me the right directions with what flies to use when and and whatnot. So I was in there, kind of getting excited, buying up a few flies and whatnot, and. Uh, was really looking forward to hitting the same rain because um, it's really coming back after the floods. And uh, it, just like the the show we talked about, Boulder Creek, everything's kind of bouncing back on that. And they've been redoing everything throughout Longmont, and then they've already redone it, most of it through Lions. There's still one section that they're still working on as far as construction and, and remaking fish habitats and stuff like that. But they've also been putting in, like, in Lions and Longmont, tons of, like, kayak obstacles and things like that and i'm not a big fan of the kayakers on the river it's kind of like jet skiers on the lake but one right. thing i love hearing is kayak obstacles that because that means all sorts of pools and eddies and things for the fish to be in so when the kayaks aren't there those are great spots to hit so i've been kind of eyeballing them as i've been driving around town and i was really hoping to 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 get after them and i was going to do a little bit of a nymphing i so my my plan was i was going to hit in lines first and um, lions throughout here, it's not hot spotting cause it's catch and release only. Don't be keeping fish. It's flies and lures only. And so the fish are starting to get a little bit better and a little bit better. Even reports of a 23 inch, uh, rainbow caught this last summer. Um, never seen a photo. It's all rumor mill. So don't have proof on it, but I am halfway leaning that it could be true. I've caught, um, up to 18 inch rainbows in there now. And the, the Browns are slowly getting bigger too. And plus they're beautiful fish. Um, river browns you've got a ton of those haven't you jason i have you know and uh i tell you a lot of people think just because it gets cold out and you know there's there's 15 inches or you know 30 inches of ice you can't uh fly fish in the winter but uh you know uh there's a lot of a lot of uh lakes or i'm sorry rivers out there that are so fishable uh, and the good thing is you don't have to get there at you know, six in the morning but your prime time is probably after 10 a.m as the, uh, the sun kind of crests over those mountains and kind of puts a little bit of warmth um, on those uh, those rivers, plus you get a little bit of a hatch if it's above 40 degrees. And just off the top of my head, I'm thinking like Deckers, Waterton Canyon, 
11 Mile Canyon, Dream Stream, the Blue. Those are all great uh, winter uh, rivers to fish. And then just in the backyard here in Denver, you do have the, the Denver South Platte. Um, it's kind of that I kind of stumbled upon that about two years ago, and just kind of off I-25 and seven, uh, Santa Fe, uh, just right through there, all the way up through uh, REI, the kayak park you just talked about. Uh, it's a lot of different species in there, and you know if you're just itching to get the, the fly rod out, I, I, I challenge you to go down to the South Platte and you know uh, fish away. There's a lot of species in there. You know, you've got your, your browns, you've got your rainbows, you've got a little, a little bit of walleye action, you got some large mouth, you got some small mouth, and there's some big, big carp all through that area, and just kind of just walk it or drive the, uh, the you know, the Denver South Platte. Um, you'll be very surprised in uh, what you uh, you see in there, and, you know, who wouldn't want to catch on to a, a 20-pound carp? You know, that, that would be a <laughs> pretty epic battle on a five weight. Yeah, and, and this show is going to lean a little bit towards the, the carp. Um, had a, a little bit of a carp experience at the Rep Your Water. And then um, one of the things that Mike and I talked about at the Laughing Grizzly was uh, one thing that uh, bites all winter long in, in the river. And he also gave the great advice that you did that uh, 10, 10, 30, let that skim ice, that anything that built up on the river overnight, uh, move off a little bit, let the sun get up and, and light up the pools a little bit. Um, uh, but he did say that during the winter, you got to be a little bit more stealthy. Waters are a little bit more low and stuff like that. So you might have to sneak up on the fish. But uh, I was like, you know, I'd love to hook into a nice rainbow or, or, or brown. And he's like, you know, don't discount the carp on the, on the same frame. And I've seen those carp in the, um, the Denver South Platte. They're no joke. And if they're anything like that in the same frame, uh, it, it'll be a fun fight on a, on a five eight fly rod. Um, It'd be a hard one to land. And I asked him, I was like, what the heck is a carp going to eat right this time of year? And he's like, you know, just use a San Juan worm. And so that was my plan. I was hoping to try to target some carp a little bit with San Juans if I can find them. Um, if not, I was going to use do a little bit of nymphing with a, a strike indicator and, you know, and vary my depths below the strike indicator, depending on the water levels and the, and the size of the pools that I found throughout Longmont, the Longmont area. And I was just going to use a, 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 a prince nymph a, a purple one and so that was kind of the plan um i did i don't know three or four years ago hook into a carp and it was during the summertime but i was using my my five weight and i was actually fishing for crappie and bluegill using a black ant on the surface you know around some vegetation on the call uh, up here on highway 66 and a massive carp came up and engulfed that ant and took off running and, and i tried playing it and fighting it a little bit and i was starting to get towards the end of my um my uh back line and i i had to try to turn his head or i was just going to run out of line and i tried turning his head and it just he just popped off my fly and that was it so you know that carp had a little black ant uh emo piercing in his lip have you ever have you ever got a fish that big on the fly rod you know and not a um not specifically a carp, but, uh, you know, it's kind of a segue into, uh, you know, ice off. I've been pretty fortunate, uh, to catch some big hogs out of, uh, Antero and Spinney in that, uh, 24, you know, the 26 inch range. And it doesn't matter to me if it's a big carp or a big, uh, cut bow or rainbow. It's, it's all about the tug right there. And, you know, as we still kind of are focused on that winter, uh, bite, you know, if you're fishing any of those, uh, rivers, you know, the biggest thing, like you said, was stay stealthy, but uh, make sure your presentation is really, really small. And this is where it gets a little bit harder for, uh, you know, a fly fisherman that are new to the sport is you've got to be uh, willing to use like a size 22, maybe even 24 uh, size uh, midge. And those are uh, they're tough to tie on. Um, and I always recommend have a few already like tied, ready to go. So you're just exchanging your leaders really quick. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a small... Uh, you know, it's a small, small fly, and, uh, you know, you got to present it very, very well during this time. I mean, there's the water's really, really cold. There's not a lot of oxygen, not a lot of big bugs flying. So presentation is uh, definitely a little more critical in the, the winter months. But uh, once we open up to that open water, it's kind of a, a game on for a lot of fish, and they're just, you throw it out there, if it's big, they're going to hit it pretty hard. So, again, I'm excited for uh Probably uh, the next probably 45 to 60 days, we should see some of the bigger, uh, bigger lakes starting to open up and uh, getting some of that uh, open water bite. 
Yeah. And hopefully this is the last big major front coming through, like freezing everything up. Um, you know, from the time that this freeze starts thawing all the way till early July, we'll have all sorts of different ice off bites. And I'm pretty excited about that. Everything from high alpine to walleye to the smallmouth spawn to largemouth spawn. There's all sorts of great bites. And then, you know, here in the metro area, even just all the lakes, as soon as they start icing off and you're allowed to put boats on, I know a lot of people will be chasing those walleye, but like at Boyd and Chatfield and Aurora Reservoir, you were to go around and troll some spoons or some HDs. I mean, you're asking for a big rainbow to slam you. They're going to be hunting and ferocious. So it's always a good time to to target those fish up here down here i mean you can troll one day in, in the denver metro area and then go up and ice fish in, in the mountains the next day so it's kind of a cool situation jason uh still have you there i'm still here i'm still here gotcha just scared i lost you there for a second but um yeah i mean you have anything else you want to add on a little bit of fly fishing before we uh move on to uh talking about uh, uh the rep your water event it, it, one thing i would tell you a lot of people it's like a 2019 type goal is hey, i want to fly a fish so uh don't be intimidated by it uh, you go into a fly shop and there's 10,000 flies or you're trying to buy a fly rod anything from you know uh the uh, bolt combo package up to the, the most expensive like sage so just understand going in you know, put a little bit of investment into it, but there's nothing wrong with buying like a Cabela's or any other sort of a big box combo package to get things going. Yeah. Uh, and again, the, the fishing community is pretty tight and they're going to give you uh, some suggestions and, you know, support your uh, small uh, fly shops and they're going to let you probably a lot of, you know, do a little testing on it, you know, casting it and so forth. And a lot of uh, these, uh, fly fishing uh, shops, uh, you know, uh, will let you, uh, take it out on the uh, the river and they have free classes so some to look at also or you know one of the great things there's so many little like groups out there with someone wanting to fish and so you know find someone that's also looking and uh, get on the get on the river i mean that's you can't you can't beat that one and you know if you're on the river you're, you're doing more than sitting behind the laptop or what have you so and you gotta put the hours in yeah for sure and you you brought up a great point about not breaking the bank on uh fly fishing um those cabela's rock combos that you can get like they, they come all lined and and come with all the little uh kit and everything it, those are essentially rebranded tfo rods so they're not bad and you know in the patriot anglers that's we have a bunch of those and i've used them multiple times and i've caught plenty of fish on them they work just as good as my orvis if not better i mean if i had to do it all over again i probably as much as i love my my orvis i've would have probably saved the money with the Cabela's route, to be honest. I'm with you. Uh, I think I've got a, you know, Cabela's combo that I've caught, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of fish. on. But, you know, I stepped up the game and became pretty passionate with my fly fishing. And I, I do have a, uh, you know, higher in Scott. But uh, I always tell people at the end of the day, when I'm volunteering with Patriot Anglers, we still have the same, you know, you know fifty fly on, at the end of the day. So, there yeah. are some nicer little pieces to some of these uh, rods if you want a faster action or a slower action type of rod. Or if you're specifically into the new thing, you want a long 10 foot 3 to be weight vice, uh, you know, a standard uh, 9 foot 5 weight. But, uh, you know, just start start small. You know, start with something affordable and uh, maybe you really enjoy it. You know, so it's like any hobby, you put the money into it. So don't get intimidated by the high dollar uh, fly rods that are sitting right next to that combo. Whether it's a TFO or all this or Ready Pen or Cabello, um, you know, yeah. it, it's, a, it's a passion. You'll you'll pursue it. And, and you know what? You don't have to be the world's best caster to catch fish. Too the the vast majority of fish I catch are within ten feet of the shoreline. So um, yeah, definitely. It's you know, you, as you go about it and you go to classes and you just get out and practice, your, your casting will get better. But you can just get started. You know, in the spring on the side of a pond and, and catch crappie and bluegill or trout in the mountains uh, ten feet from the shoreline, just using a simple black ant next to a bush. It's like training wheels. Works well. Yeah, absolutely. That's you know. Uh, that black ant, ant is, uh, that's a money fly, you know, in the high alpine lakes. Uh, whether it's a, a little black ant or a little red ant, um, it's going to be one of my top three flies if I'm, you know, up high in the mountains. But uh, it's 
great fly for, uh, you know, for crappies or for some warm water species. So, you know, just yeah. a lot of research, you know, to get in to, to get comfortable. But uh, there's a lot of people out there that YouTube is great. You know, we've already kind of said, you know, you know hit up your local uh, fly fishing shops because they're going to take care of you also. But uh, you know, for sure. it's a great passion. I really enjoy it. But, um, you know, I like to fish uh, ice fish. I, like, I don't hold anything against uh, uh, spinning, spinning rods. I love to throw the spinning rod and throw some big metal after some big pike and other, uh, you know, big still water uh, fish. So, you know, I, I don't discriminate. I, I, I want to catch fish at the end of the day. So whether it's a fly rod or a spinning rod or a nice rod, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use them all. Yeah. The goal is to fight the skunk. So whatever works, whatever method you have to do, as long as it's within uh, regulations and, and legal, uh, by all means. So, and while we're talking a little bit of fly fishing, uh, let's, let's go right into the uh, rep your water. So um, last week, they had a, a Facebook event uh, posted for Rep Your Water, and they were going to do a film premiere for um, a company called Riversmith, which makes the uh, rod, the giant rod holders you see on top of all the the trucks and SUVs for people fishing up and down the rivers and things like that. And they're right. high end and, and a pretty good product, from what I understand. I haven't used them personally, and I've thought about getting that for my Jeep. I wish they would make those rod holders in a spinning rod or for bait casters as well as fly, fly, fly rods. And so maybe one day they will, and then I might pick it up. Um, but uh, the cool part was is I thought that there was going to be a straight-up film premiere. But what it was was a film premiere for, is a fundraiser for a organization called um, the Mayfly Project. And okay. I hadn't heard about this this organization and uh, I met some of the folks that uh, ran it and I got talking to them and it, and it was like really similar to the Patriot anglers and what we've done there. And it really intrigued me. And the more we talked, I mean, the more it sounded like the Patriot anglers and it's a cool concept what they do. And instead of taking veterans and things like that, they're actually um, working with foster kids and it was really cool. So the whole premise is that they take foster kids fly fishing in Colorado. And then I think uh, I want to say it's in Arkansas or Alabama or something like that. And we will have the folks on from project or from the Mayfly project in a future episode, possibly even next week to dive all in about it. So we probably have a lot more fly fishing and, you know, a lot more how fishing helps people out, um, especially these kids and veterans and stuff to come in the next week. But it, it was really cool. And one of the videos that they premiered tonight was on the Mayfly project and it was just tear jerking. And it was talking about how they use fly fishing and teach these kids that and give them a lot of, of stuff from, you know, equipment from donations and, and all the fly fishing companies out there and stuff like that. And they're using it to actually give kids a little bit of purpose and a little meaning to their lives. And they're, they're trying to combat the, the high rate of folks going to prison. Cause like once you're in the prison system, it's, it's a nightmare to get out and to make your life clean and things like that. And I think we've all seen that from all those prison shows. And so I thought it was really cool that, that they're using fishing to combat high prison like high incarceration rates and they're they're doing it targeting foster kids which have a high rate of going i think it's like uh i, I don't want to quote it so um it, it's definitely a high rate and we'll definitely get those numbers in the next episode when we have those folks on so i just thought it was really sweet and um to boot it was at the rep your water warehouse have you been there yet i haven't but uh i've got about three or four other hats so uh i definitely like what they do uh on the hat side uh you know, with the 50, 50 states and territories and some of the conservation efforts with some of their, uh, you know, Western uh, conservation uh, hats. So uh, definitely uh, one of my, uh, my hat brands that I like to wear all the time. Yeah. Rip Your Water is pretty solid. Not only does like a bit of the, every purchase goes to conservation groups, but they're, they're sitting here holding fundraisers for folks like the, uh, the Mayfly project. So that's pretty big time in my book. And I've worn rep your water hats for the last couple of years. And I agree with you. I think they're outstanding hats and they always got cool designs and, and things coming out. And I've actually bought two hats in the last two months of rep your water. Um, I bought one the, the other night to help support the fundraiser, which I actually got there. It's a brand new one out and I'll, I'll post a picture of it, but I think it's cool, but I've got a rep your water carp hat. <laughs> <laughs> so I will be sporting the carp hat this spring and summer here and there. So look for it. As a matter of fact, I'll wear it at the St. Frank fishing experience, just so you can find me. If you're talking to the guy at the carp hat, you know, you're talking to me. Um, but, uh, plus, plus rep your waters. Uh, it's a Colorado small business. So anytime you can help those guys out, you know, you're, you're doing something good. 
yeah. know, you talk about the, uh, the the Mayfly organization. There's a lot of correlations with even the Patriot anglers. It's just, just getting those people out on the water where they kind of, I don't want to say they lose themselves, but uh, they're out of their environment where they, you know, might be dreading. So, uh, you know, good for them, uh, you know, taking those uh, you know, at-risk uh, kiddos out on the water and hopefully uh, making changes in their lives. Yeah, but, uh, for sure. So, and, and it was really cool. And so they premiered three videos at the event and one of them was for the, the Mayfly project. And the other one was um, for a fly slash surf shop and out based in in california i think it was maybe it was florida but it was a pretty cool video something interesting to check out but the middle video of the three that they they premiered that night was really cool and it was actually about this this lady and i'll post a link for all these videos so you guys can watch them and see what we're talking about but this lady who um is a partial amputee on one of her arms um and she's actually a a world-renowned athlete rock climber she's like the national geographic like woman explorer of the year and and all that and she's right here in colorado and it turns out she's like an avid fly fisherman too and so and she was actually there at the event so it was kind of cool to to see her and see her video and it was pretty inspiring and you know and in the video it showed her like yeah, it takes me a lot longer to, to tie a knot, but I get it done and I still catch fish and I might not be the best caster or the best person to bring in, but I still catch fish. And it was all about that. She was out there and doing it. And you know, as much as like as frustrating as fly fishing can be sometimes with the, the knots and losing flies and, and all that stuff. Um, it, it was just awesome to see her at it and see her spirit and, and to, to know that it's a healthy sport. It's, it's, it's good for you and to stick with it. And, and who cares if it takes you 20 minutes to tie a knot, you're still eventually going to catch a fish. And it, and it was just awesome. It was an awesome video and uh, I'm glad I went there that night. So, um, fairly inspiring and not to mention the walls of just hats. I mean, every possible hat that rep your water has that's on display there and that, that their warehouse is open to the public. So if you've never been there, I, I suggest you go. It's right. It's just a little bit South of me in Erie. So just, just a bit North of Denver, I'd check their hours before you head up, but, uh, a great place to go. Great place to go talk fishing and, and talk fly fishing for sure. No, that's awesome. And that the lady you just talked about, I mean, it, it brings a lot of those, like, you know, just shows what resiliency is and not letting a, a handicap stop her from something that she really enjoys. So, uh, you know, kudos to her and, uh, you know, a role model for uh, so many other people. Yeah, for sure. So um, it was great hanging out. I will definitely be looking for more events from Report Your Water. I guess they have open warehouse type events all the time. So as I see them, I will share them uh, through Vantage Facebook. I think they're quality and definitely worth sharing. And I think we'll take a short break and we'll be back with our next segment, talking a little bit about the St. Brain fishing experience in St. Brain uh, State Park. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the second segment of episode 16 of Vintage Fishing Radio. Uh, Lewis Chapman here and uh, filling in for Dustin tonight is Jason Reed, friend of the show. Um, I think the last time we had you on was the Ice Fishing Roundtable, wasn't it? That's right. And before that, the two of us were on site at Spinney, I believe, or was it uh, 11 Mile? It was 11 mile. We did it from the Marina parking lot, 11 mile. We did a show from there. Yep. That's right. While we were grilling some brats, right? That's right. So, um, yeah, a lot of fun recording the show with you. A lot of fun fishing. And uh, we'll definitely have to do some more shows out from the water. Maybe uh, we'll see if there's a good enough reception up in Wyoming to do do a show up there when it comes to (laughs) the internet. But uh, let's let's jump into what's coming up here in a couple weeks. Uh, I think it's March 6th. Uh, don't quote me on it um but the uh saint brain fishing experience i'm going to look up the exact date while i'm typing it so you you were the, at the experience last year with the patriot anglers jason you want to tell me uh, uh what it was all about and what you thought of it right kind of just it was a, an open house for uh fishing and outdoor type activities 
um, hosted by uh, Colorado Park and Wildlife. But a uh, great experience. Obviously, we had great weather. But uh, you know, to, instead of you know doing a podcast or anything, you know, we're live in person, uh, telling a telling the, the locals uh, about what Patriot Anglers is, um, you know, I'm on site, but a lot of different groups out there. And I know this year it's uh, they've got a handful of new uh, participants, so it's a great experience. And, uh, you know, I think all you need to do is have uh, your park, state park pass, and you're in uh, for the experience. I know there's a lot of uh, other groups that are giving away uh, little, little small little uh, prizes and trinkets and barbecues and so forth. So good experience to come down and kind of a – Kind of a open uh, open up the new season uh, for lake fishing as we uh, progress into the, the spring uh, fishing uh, time frame. Yeah, it's just a great, fun, family friendly event, and uh, lots of lectures and, and talk about fishing. If you want to sit down on those, but if you just want to walk around to all the different booths and just talk fishing with with all the different. Uh, uh, organizations and pros and stuff, they'll be more than glad to give you a few pointers and talk a lot of fish and stories with you. So it's just great to get amongst other anglers and talk. And I thought it was a good replacement um, event for the Northern Colorado Fishing Expo that was up in Loveland that no longer exists. So I hope this keeps going. I hope the weather holds out for it. Um, I did today sneak out and go to St. Frank State Park and I was able to sit down with Sean Dunlavy. He's uh, the lead ranger at the park and he's the the host and the guy that puts in all the work to make sure that this event happens. So um, I want to air the the interview for you. So uh, here it is. Welcome back to Vantage Fishing. Lewis Chapman here and I'm with a special guest, Mr. Sean Dunlavy, who's a ranger at St. Vrain State Park and he's here to Talk about the park and then a big event that's coming up, the St. Vrain Fishing Experience. How are you doing, Sean? I'm doing excellent. Thank you. How are you doing today? Pretty good. good Pretty good. good. Do you want to give us a quick rundown of the event before we jump into talking some fishing and other things? Yeah, absolutely. This is our uh, second annual fishing event. It's going to be on Saturday, March 16th, uh, the day before St. Patrick's Day. It's going to be from 9 in the morning till 2 in the afternoon. It is an event where... If you're driving into the park, you're going to need to pay for a parks pass unless you already have an annual for the vehicle itself. But then the, once you get to the event, the event isn't going to charge you any money to be there as part of the event. There's going to be um, some hot dogs um, for sale there for an uh, inexpensive price for lunch, and we should have a coffee truck in too. But otherwise, there will be people who are, so, so to speak, vendors, vendors. Um, it's our non CPW partners. There's going to be 14 of them this year. Last year we had 12 and it does include people like Jack's and Shields and Eagle Claw, but they're not actually there to sell. Uh, they might do some promotion, which is fine, but mostly they're there to give you information and to actually help you know about fishing and how to fish and either get you started in it, or it's also going to be good for people who already know quite a bit about fishing. Yeah. So, um, Vantage Fishing, uh, Dustin and I, we, we attended the, the event last year. And it was mm-hmm. a great one. And what, where I really thought it kind of went well is it was a great replacement for the fishing expo in Larimer County that right. shut down. And I even like this event a little bit better because it's we're not selling stuff. Nobody's really selling stuff. It's exactly what you said. It, it's about, um, about teaching people how to fish and about showing new tricks, techniques, just talking fishing in general. And it was pretty casual and um it flowed really well and i really enjoyed the event um so as far as cpw what do you guys have planned for the event as far as talks or anything like that or do you, a fish tank what, what sure. all do you have? um yeah for the parks and wildlife side of the house for for those partners we're going to have the aquatic nuisance species people here talking about the uh zebra mussels and how to prevent that um, we're going to have boat safety here, talking about boat safety. And I believe this year they're going to be doing the uh, T-shirts again for the kids. Um, then uh, we're going to have a lot of how-to fishing stuff, including some fishing gear that we are going to be able to loan out to people. So if people don't have their gear, um, we'll have loaner gear. Now, adults will still need a license. So if you're um, 17 or older, you're going to need your fishing license. Or I'm sorry, 16 or older, you're going to need your fishing license. Um, but otherwise, you know, kids are going to be able to fish even without a license and, uh, we'll do that. There's going to be a kid's corner this year, which is kind of new for us. You're right. There will be also a fish tank. 
And we'll probably do a couple different talks also. I know there's going to be one talk on how to clean and cook your own fish. And uh, I should be giving a, a short talk on just fishing specific to the park and what I think I know about fishing in the park. I'm not a good fisherman myself, but I do talk to a lot of fishermen. So I should have at least some information to pass along specific to the park. A lot of the other talks are going to be uh, more general, just about panfish or about trout fishing or about walleye. Um, but I'll be doing a little park specific talk. Yeah. So you talked fishing license there, and this is just a quick like kind of sidestep, but um, April 1st, right, is when we all need new fishing licenses? Yeah. April so, 1st is the new fishing license. So, um, they did go up this year for, for some people. The seniors are going to be paying a little more. The one thing that's different this year that um, may apply to some people listening is that um, the uh, license for people who are 16 and 17 years old is actually going to be less expensive. So there is one license that went down this year and that 16 and 17 year olds still need a license, but there's just going to be a discounted rate. Okay. So. Just wanted to get that reminder in there. Um, yeah. So the event's really good, fun event. Hopefully the weather will hold up for us. Um, yeah. A little cold right now as we're recording that, but last year it was perfect. You had a fire going in the morning until that's um, right. Until it started warming up. Yeah. And I thought that was kind of neat. And then um, quite a few, um, not vendors, but but it, more or less information booths. Um, Patriot Anglers, just one day with the veteran stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I know Vantage Fishing will be there. Mile High Fishing Magazine will be there. And then a lot of these stores. And one cool thing about it is there's so many different kind of pros and, and so many great fishermen that are going to be there that are great at all sorts of different types of fishing. There's going to be somebody there that can answer your questions most likely for whatever fishing or whatever you're looking at. And, um, and the St. Brain State Park is a great place to kind of put that information to the test because you got, I mean, how many bodies of water are here? There's a 10 or sometimes people count it as 11, but I'd say 10 fishable bodies of water that are open to the public. There will probably be others in the future. I mean, we have a couple ponds that right now are not open to the public, but sometime in the future will be. But just having those 10 ponds is great because you've got ponds that are heavily stocked with trout You've got ponds that have no trout. Um, you've got ponds that have every species of fish that's in this park, including there's two ponds with pike. So you do have two different ones with pike. You have catch and release bass ponds that should produce some good sized bass. And then you have other ponds where people who do keep bass can keep those bass legally. So. Yeah. And, you know, I was fishing um, Pelican last summer from the float tube. And it was one of those things to where, I was catching bass and walleye off the same little sandbar right and left so that there's so many different species to target. You can really kind of go for with uh, anything you really would like. And then it's also a great boating destination. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and when the boat ramp might be open? Yeah, um, that's a good question because right now we are to the point where we would have had the boat ramp open, except we still have ice. Um, the boat ramp, and the uh, Blue Heron Reservoir, the only one that has a ramp and actually allows trailered boats, um, should be open March 1st or when the ice is off. And we do still have ice right now because of all this cold weather. Now, having said that, what's um, a little unfortunate, I guess you'd say, is that our ice fishing season wasn't as big as some other years because the, the ice never really got much more than that four inches. We never say safe or unsafe, but we recommend four inches. This year we had ice around four inches for a while. A lot of times it was between two and a half and three and a half, which does get fished, although it's less than we might recommend. But as we're sitting here today, we're actually looking at some open water. Um, most of the ice that is out there is probably about an inch thick. And I would be surprised if you can find anything over two and so we don't really have ice fishing going on right now, but we also don't necessarily have a lot of open water yet for open water fishing. A little bit unfortunate for this exact day or this week. On the other hand, it means that this spring we're going to have a lot of holdover trout because they didn't all get caught for the ice fishing season. I was going to say the ice off bite is probably going to be amazing for trout and, and a few other species too. Um, yeah. Bass as the waters warm up and then walleye as they get into spawn mode here against the rocks. And so the fish didn't really see much pressure all winter long. So they haven't seen lures. So it could be an opportunity to, to trick one into that bite for sure. Yeah. yeah. So um, again, do you want to give us a quick rundown on uh, when, what time yeah, and absolutely. all that for the, the event? 
So it's uh, Saturday, March 16th, uh, the day before St. Patrick's Day. It's going to be from uh, 9 in the morning until 2 in the afternoon right here at St. Vrain. Like I said, you will need for your vehicle to have either an annual pass or a day pass. But the event itself, once you get in, you might spend a couple dollars for a hot dog or a cup of coffee. But other than that, you may not spend any money at all. And you should be able to keep yourself entertained the whole the whole time. Well, I, I have one last question while I still have you on, Sean. Absolutely. What's your favorite part about this park? Um, I like that even though we're right next to the highway, that we're still more scenic than people would think. We have an outstanding view of uh, Longs and Meeker when we don't have a bunch of clouds. And there's really more wildlife than people would know. Um, every day I, in the, in the wintertime, it's rare that I don't see one or two bald eagles. In the summertime, it's almost impossible not to see osprey. We've got turkeys on park, and then we have both whitetail and mule deer that we see occasionally. We see a mink occasionally. And then just talking to the fishermen, really that's my favorite part of being a ranger is talking to people and just getting out, talking to fishermen. It's not just checking license. It's just asking, how you doing today? And are you having any luck? So, Awesome. Well, Sean, thanks for joining me. And I hope that a lot of folks come out to that event. It's definitely worth it. Come out, say hi, just talk a lot of fishing with us and have a great day. Absolutely. Thanks again. Yep. A lot of great information on the St. Vrain fishing experience. I can't wait to go there. I'll be wearing the Vantage Fishing uh, cap, but I can also be talking Patriot Anglers. And, and you'll be with the Patriot Anglers there this year, uh, Jason? I am, absolutely. So I'll be wearing one of their blue shirts and probably a Rep Your Water uh, pad also. Yeah. Um, hey, make sure you don't have a ca car pad on. I got dibs on that. <laughs> That's right. I've got a grilling one. So, but, um, yeah, so it'll be a great event and I would, I do want to take a little bit and just talk about the park in general. Um, and I know we talked a little bit about it in the interview with Sean, but, uh, you've ice fished there with me before, haven't you? Absolutely. Uh, last season, uh, I think one of the cool things with St. Brain is, is, uh, accessibility. It's about 45 minutes north of Denver. Um, it's in your right backyard, uh, just, uh, up by 25 off that long line exit so it's pretty easy to get to with the family um you can pretty much drive right up to the lakes uh, a lot of different species if you want to go into kind of what they uh they stock there because it's kind of a uh, smorgasbord of uh species yeah for sure and you know there's a few ponds i fish more than others and sandpiper first and foremost is the pond to go to if you want to get kids on fish and if you want to teach kids fishing and you know what it's also good for, because it's got a lot of good clear back cast area, is somebody learning how to fly fish. That is the perfect place to go and do that. Um, so definitely a lot of stalker trout in there. Um, it does have some bass, and there's a lot of crappie and uh, bluegill rolling around that pond, too. So it's a pretty fun one. Um, and I think that's one that sees the most uh, pressure, but they stock it pretty well. So it doesn't doesn't ever seem like the fishing's bad there. Every time I've been by that that lake, everybody's catching hand over fist. Personally, um, I fish three different ones the most. Uh, I'll fish bald eagle, which is the no bait allowed. It's a catch and release for largemouth bass or all bass. And that's where the big ones are. And the biggest fish that I've caught out of this, out of St. Vrain State Park have been out of bald eagle with the exception of a fish I'll tell you about in a little bit that I caught in Blue Heron Reservoir. But bald eagle is definitely a challenge. I will fish it multiple times a year and a lot of times I'll get skunked on it and it's just those big bass in there eat well and they've seen everything. So it's hard, but when you do get something, it's really nice. So if you're looking for that trophy bass close to town, uh, that's the place to try. And then Pelican Pond, I probably fish the, the most after that. And that's on the Northern end of the property. And Jason, the reason I fish Pelican is it's got um, the stalker trout there. So I'm probably guaranteed to catch something at least. I'm not going to get the skunk like I, I would on bald eagle if I don't, if I don't land that big in, but it's also got walleye. I think it's got saw guy. It's got largemouth. It, it's got northern pike. It's got crappie. So it's got the plethora. It's got catfish and I always fish it and I'll drag stuff around to pick off like the trout and the walleye and some crappie. But I also am throwing a big jerk bait or a big spoon everywhere I go in hopes of getting a big pike because I think they transplanted some pike from 
uh, I want to say it's Spinny Mountain. I can't be, I could be wrong on that, but they definitely transplanted Pike in there uh, a while back after the floods because a whole bunch of carp got in from the St. Brain Creek on the north side of the, of the pond into the pond. And so they put the pike in there to help control that carp population. So it's a fun one to fish. Have you fished that one yet? I have, you know, I, I pretty much, I bounced around from lake to lake. And just like you said, it's, it's a menu of fish, whether it's got my, you know, fill of rainbow trout and maybe I'm going after a catfish or like you said, uh, the two lakes that are catching our leaves for a big, big uh, bass. You can't beat that. And, you know, if I've got the kiddos with me, uh, it's got a lot of like easy graded trails that are, you know, a mile, mile and a half. So, you know, if my daughter or son is, isn't really wanting to fish right now, we can, uh, walk around the lake. And uh, I think one of the great things with St. Rain is they've got a pretty healthy population of wildlife there. Uh, their Facebook page is really, really active with, um, some of the night cameras and some of the wildlife that you'd be really surprised that for a state park that's right off of I-25 has a lot of wildlife to include uh, some breeding of bald eagles. So it's, it's a pretty uh, great experience to go out there, uh, you know, not just to fish, but uh, just to hike, have a picnic. Uh, I think there's a little over seven miles of roads and trails for the bikes. So uh, a lot of different things to do. So, you know, take your friend or you know, your spouse and maybe he or she isn't a big fisherman, but there's a lot to do for the whole family out there. So good place to go. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I want to give the, the, the rangers and the staff there and all the people that frequent the park some big kudos because it's a high traffic park because it's it, in a primo location that's close to everybody right off the highway. And you think a park like that, like all like the heavy fished areas that I, I see all around like northern Colorado sometimes can get a little trashed out. This park is never trashed out. There's like never litter. There's never a bunch of line or, or, uh, real containers or power bait containers or, or, you know, the styrofoam worm containers laying around. These ponds are clean and it's, it's amazing that it is. I mean, cause you would think with the pressure that it would just be filthy there, but it's not. And it's a gorgeous park. And, you know, with Long's Peak in the background, you said tons of wildlife. So it's a great like half day destination to get away with the kids or even if you just want to get out on water and you don't have that much time and you've got all sorts of options there. It's, it's a great place. So, um, I did get a bucket list fish there. You want to guess what it was? I'm going to go with a saw guy. No, no, cold, cold. Um, think about the car pat. <laughs> so um, blue heron reservoir, uh, myself and Tommy Hicks, another Patriot anglers guy, Marine Corps. He does eat crayons. Careful if you come in contact with him. Um, Let's just, him and I went fishing out on my boat on Blue Heron. We were chasing walleye and I was throwing a jerk bait for early season walleye two years ago and I got hooked on to a big fish and I thought I had a nice walleye or something like that and fought it up to the boat and got it there. And I actually had a foul hooked grass carp. And so that was my first and only grass carp that I've caught. So, um, I mean, I've got a common carp and I've got a grass carp. And so this year, the goal is to get one of the mirror carp. Have you ever seen one of those? You know, not, um, I've seen them on the internet, obviously, but no, I've never really fished with anyone that's actually caught one. So that would be a kind of a cool one, you know, not always like highly advertised, but, uh, definitely one to take off the uh, list of fish to catch. Yeah, for sure. Just keeping the carp theme, uh, for tonight. So, but, um, yeah, I mean, you got any, uh, final words for, uh, St. Brain Reservoir? Or, I mean, Reservoir um, State Park? Super easy to get to, uh, guaranteed to catch fish for the kids. And, you know, every dog has his day, so the chances of catching a big, big, big pike or a big bass uh, are afforded there. So it has a little bit of everything for everyone. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, you'll catch me bouncing around the park probably once or twice a month. So if you see me fishing into the shorelines or you see me out there uh, on the float pontoon or my boat, stop by and say hi. It is one of my favorite destinations since it is close by. And, I I like spending a little bit of time on Blue Heron Reservoir where I got that carp and then uh, back in Pelican. So, but um, yeah, so let's talk a little bit about some teasers from, for some future shows. So I've been in contact with the leadership and the folks that uh, uh, founded the Mayfly Project. So they are definitely going to come on and talk about everything there is to that. 
And while we're on there, I know that you're on the board of directors for the Patriot Anglers, Jason. So I've seen maybe in the next uh, three or four episodes, if uh, maybe yourself and somebody else from Patriot Anglers would uh, jump on and, and talk about what's going on and talk about the organization a little bit. Absolutely. Uh, you know, obviously we're in full ice mode, but uh, as we start to hit that open water, uh, look for a lot of uh events sponsored by Patriot Anglers uh, to include uh, family friendly, getting the whole group out there to veteran only uh, expedition trips. But uh, on that aspect, I'm excited to get some veterans out on uh, open water catching fish and then on a personal level, uh, pretty excited to hit up that open water in, in Southern Wyoming. So you know, 2019 for me looks like a really good uh, fishing year. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, we'll keep talking about the ice off bite as, as we roll through uh, spring as well. Um, I was looking at uh, Facebook posts from a year ago, and I was already catching walleye, um, open water. And you know what? I think the, the lakes are growing by the inch as we speak of ice. So totally different season this year. And so I don't know how that walleye spawn is going to go, but we'll try to keep you updated as, as best we can on that bite as well as others as they as they come through the ice off. And, uh, you know, I we're, we're so excited about fly fishing and just float tubing and boating and walleye and bass and all sorts of crazy opportunities that we have here in Colorado as we go into spring. But I don't want to neglect that ice fishing is still going on. And so I think here in the next episode or two, we're definitely going to talk some late season ice fishing. I know that Dylan and Granby – and a lot of these lakes up in the high country are going to be froze and um, you're going to be able to ice fish them up until almost April, if not into early April in some waters. So you have to be careful as, as ice melts. I mean, ice melting does not make noise. So we're growing ice does. So keep that in mind. But uh, is there like a late season ice fishing bite you're, you're uh, looking to get on? You know, I am. Uh, um, I had a set a goal of a 30-inch laker, so I haven't had that yet. I've got a couple in the 20s. So, like you said, uh, the Grand the Grand Lakes uh, should be iceable definitely into you know late April, early May, and there's a lot of alpine lakes that are really, really thick. So uh, some of those are going to stay iced probably until like mid June, early Ju- July. Thinking specifically uh, lakes off of Cameron Pass that are going to be well into the summer, but uh, just because we're you're starting to see some open water uh, on the front range, a lot of those alpine and those high country lakes are still like a lot of solid ice. I can tell you that South Park, you're not going to find uh, in excess of 15 inches of ice all through there. North Park is the same way. Uh, you know, all of your big lakes still have a lot of ice. Uh, your metro lakes still have ice. Just be safe out there and fill with a partner. Um, and it's bed, spud bar, like Lewis just said, we're obviously in a cold spell here in Denver. So, uh, you know, there's some growing ice really fast. So, uh, still excited for ice, ice, uh, season, but, uh, just as excited for the ice off. Yeah. And, you know, I didn't think I was going to get another ice fishing opportunity this year, but I think I might. Um, I actually just posted a video of my only catch through the ice on Vantage Fishing's Facebook page. Uh, if you want to go check it out, it's a nice uh, rainbow from 11 mile. But uh, I've been actually halfway thinking of, um, as I get a little bit further along on uh, my recovery from, from the injury here in the next few weeks, I might try to get up to Dylan and go see Randy at Alpine Fishing Adventures and try to get out some Arctic char and uh, make it two two trips on the ice this year for me. So I, I'm going to try to make that happen, and that's kind of where, where I'm at with it. Um, as always, if you have found or uh, if you found value or enjoy uh, our radio shows and our blogs, please like and share. Um, the more people we can get them out to, it, the better. All of our content is free and will stay free. So thank you for following and, and listening to all of our stuff here at uh, Vantage Fishing. And, you know, as we always wrap up these shows, Jason, uh, I just want to say fight the skunk. That's right. Tight lines to everybody out there. <laughs>